Hello students, today we will discuss about the posterior compartment of leg. In today's lecture, we basically talk only about the muscles. We will see how these muscles will act and what are the important name of these muscles. So let us start one by one what is about the posterior compartment of leg. Now when you will see the posterior compartment of leg, the important thing is that the posterior compartment is also very commonly known as calf. So the muscles of the calf that means we are talking about the posterior compartment. Now this posterior compartment divided into the superficial group of muscle and deep group of the muscle by a transversely placed transversely placed fascia and in this diagram you can appreciate that how this transversely placed fascia is here. Now this is your posterior surface or the posterior part of the leg. This is the anterior part of the your leg. Now in this you have the tibia here. This is the fibula and in between there is a septum. Now this horizontal septum or transversely placed septum divided this part of the leg into compartment. Now here you can see that you know there is a interosseous membrane. Now this is the interosseous membrane between the tibia and fibula and the area anterior to the interosseous membrane is anterior compartment and this is the posterior compartment of leg. Now in this posterior compartment you are having the superficial group of the muscle and the deep group of the muscles. Now what are the name of superficial group? Now superficial group is having the three muscles, one is gastrocnemius, plantaris and soleus. Now out of these three, the plantaris is a very small muscle or sometimes it may be absent. While the gastrocnemius and soleus are the two big muscle in the calf. So the two head of gastrocnemius and soleus, that means when you will see the arrangement you will realize that gastrocnemius is having two heads. So these two heads and one soleus, all the three jointly named as triceps sure, which is a very commonly asked question in your exam. What do you mean by triceps sure? Triceps sure is the two head of gastrocnemius and the soleus muscle collectively known as triceps. All three, all three muscles are supplied by the tibial nerve. So when you will see the sciatic nerve, you know that sciatic nerve is made up of two component, tibial part of the sciatic nerve and peroneal component of sciatic nerve. Now this tibial component of sciatic nerve supply the muscles on posterior compartment of leg. Now here, if you will see the soleus, the gastrocnemius, that is the triceps sure, what you are able to understand that this is the posterior compartment of leg and in this posterior compartment, this is your most superficial muscle which is known as gastrocnemius. Now this gastrocnemius is going downward and it is forming a thick tendon and this is known as tendoachillus. Now deep to this tendoachillus, you can see that there is a one more muscle outline which is visible here. Now this muscle outline line which is visible here is soleus. So what will happen that the soleus and both the two heads of gastrocnemius join together to form a common tendon which is known as tendoachillus and that will go downward and it insert on the calcaneum on posterior surface. Clear? Next is what are the deep group of muscles? Now the deep group of muscles are first is popliteus, then you will have three bipinnate muscles. Now this is again the question of your exam. Now when you will see the deep group of the muscles, you will find the flexors. Now you have to keep this thing in mind that when you are reading the forearm, the flexors are present in anterior compartment. But when we are reading the leg, the uh, flexors are present in the posterior compartment of leg. So we are discussing the posterior compartment. So you will find the flexor digitorum longus, 
flags are hallucis longus. Apart from that, you will find one more very important muscle is known as tibialis posterior. So, these are the four muscles which are present in the deep group of posterior compartment of leg. The long tendons passes under the flexor retinoculum and they will enter into the sole of the foot. So, dear students, whenever you are reading the sole of the foot, before the sole, you should know about the extrinsic muscles of the sole. These are the extrinsic muscles which are having the long tendon and these tendon will enter into the sole. Now, the entry gate from the posterior compartment of the leg into the foot is having a area is known as flexor retinoculum. Now, you will find this retinoculum on the medial side of the calcaneum and behind the medial malleolus. So, you have to keep this thing in mind that the long tendons of the posterior compartment of the leg enters into the sole from the medial side of your joint not on the lateral side. The nerve of the posterior compartment again I told you it should be the tibial come now. The another thing is that the arteries are the posterior tibial artery and its peroneal branch. You know that the popliteal artery divide and into the anterior and posterior tibial and we are talking about the posterior compartment. So, but obviously you will have the posterior tibial artery. Now here in this diagram you have to keep this thing in mind that this is your medial malleolus and you can see that this is the medial side of your calcaneum. Now, between this malleolus and the calcaneum, you are having this white color area which I am converting into the green color. Now, deep to this green color, there is a space. Now, this is known as flexor retinoculum and deep to this flexor retinoculum, you can see that the tendons are entering into the sole. And when the tendons are passing deep to this flexor retinoculum, they envelop by the tendon sheath and this tendon sheath prevent the friction. So, here you have to keep in mind that this is the long tendons. Now, which are the main long tendons? One is tibialis posterior, flexor hallucis longus, flexor digitorum longus. So, these long tendons are entering into the sole from the medial side of ankle joint or I should say posterior to the medial malleolus. Now, we will discuss one by one. First is the gastrocnemius. Now, gastrocnemius is the largest and the most superficial muscle of the posterior compartment. It arises by the two head, medial and lateral. The larger head is the medial head and you have to keep this thing in mind that the origin site of the medial and lateral head is different. The medial head arises from the medial condyle, but from the posterior superior aspect, while the lateral head arises from the lateral condyle, but from the lateral surface of the condyle. Now, what is the difference? Now, see, this is the posterior view of your femur. Now, in this posterior view, this is the medial side, this is the lateral side. Now, I told you that the lateral head arises from the lateral condyle and medial head arises from medial condyle. But the medial condyle is arising from the posterior superior area. It is arising from posterior superior area of medial condyle. While the lateral head is arising from the lateral surface of lateral condyle. Now, this is the important thing to understand that the point of origin of both the head is different. Now, when you will see this lateral side, here you can see the lateral side of your lateral condyle. You have to keep in mind, there is a very prominent groove is present and that groove is for the origin of popliteus muscle. So, this is the area where you can have the groove for popliteus. Now, above the popliteus, there is a prominence is known as lateral epicondyle. Now, above the lateral epicondyle, you will have the space or the groove for the origin of lateral head of gastrocnemius. So, the large medial head arises from the posterior superior part of or the surface of medial condyle with adjoining popliteal surface of the shaft of the femur, while the lateral head 
it arises from the lateral surface of the lateral condyle of the femur and the important thing is that there is a smooth pit there is a pit or depression for the origin of lateral head and this pit lies above the lateral epicondyle and groove for the origin of popliteus. So this is again the question of your exam that you have the marking here and the question comes is that which are the two muscles which are the two muscles arises from the lateral surface of lateral condyle. So you have to keep in mind that lower groove is for the popliteus upper pit or the depression is for the lateral head of gastrocnemius. Now what is the insertion of gastrocnemius? So the fleshy belly of the two head descend and unite in the middle of the leg and it form a broad thin aponeurotic tendon. So here you can see that this is the view from the lateral side where you can see that this is the superficial muscle and this is your gastrocnemius. Now as the gastrocnemius will go downward, it will convert into the aponeurosis. So you can appreciate this part is white in color and this is your aponeurosis of gastrocnemius. Now it unites with the tendon of the soleus to form a thick tendon and this is the strongest tendon of the body which is known as tendoacalis or tendocalcaneus. So this is very important question which is the strongest tendon of the body answer is tendoacalis. So here you can see that this lower portion is known as tendoacalis and in this lower portion this tendoacalis is formed by the soleus which is deeper muscle. This is the soleus which is the deeper muscle and the gastrocnemius which is the superficial muscle and in between you also have the plantaris. So this is the important thing or concept to understand that tendoacalis is a tendon or it is it is formed by the two muscles basically superficial gastrocnemius deep is soleus. Now it insert into the middle of the posterior surface of calcaneum. Now this is again important that when you will see the insertion point it is not on the superior surface. If you will see superior surface of the calcaneum the tendon is inserting here which is the posterior surface of calcaneum. Now what about the plantaris? I told you that plantaris is a very small muscle which may be absent in some, case, some cases. So it arises from the lower part of the lateral supracondylar line of the femur. Now here again you can see that this is the lateral supracondylar line. Now from this lateral supracondylar line this small muscle is arising but when you will do the dissection you will realize that its tendon is present below the medial head of gastrocnemius. So this is this should be the medial head of gastrocnemius but when I cut this medial head once I cut this medial head I am <coughs> I am able to see this tendon of your plantaris. So the origin is from the lateral side after taking origin the tendon will take it turn towards the medial side it enters deep to the your medial head of gastrocnemius. So it is a slender tendon it runs from lateral to medial and it become deep to the medial head of gastrocnemius. So when you will do the dissection you have to cut the medial head to see this tendon. Now this tendon continues along the medial border of tendoacalis here and then ultimately it will merge with this tendoacalis. Now this is the question of your exam. The question is that the tendon of plantaris is look like a nerve. This tendon of plantaris sometimes confused like a nerve in the dissection and it is known as freshman's nerve. So this is the question what is freshman's nerve? That is the tendon of plantaris. So it can be harvested for use as a tendon graft but it may absent unilaterally or bilaterally in 10 to 20 percent subjects which I already explained. Now we will talk about the soleus. Now when you will remove your gastrocnemius you will find a muscle is uh, a bulky multipinnate muscle is soleus. So this is the first question example of multipinnate muscle. Now it is so named because its shape is like the sole of the foot. Now when you will see the muscle it is like the sole of the foot. So that is why the name comes as soleus. 
Now the muscle arises from the three areas. Now this is very important to understand. Now see, this soleus is having major origin from the tibia. Now when you will see the tibia, this is the posterior surface of the tibia and fibula. You are having an oblique line on the tibia. Now this oblique line is known as soleal line. So the posteriorly, the soleal line of the tibia is the main origin along with the middle third of the medial border of tibia. So the first origin is from the tibia. So the origin starts or present on the soleal line and the upper part of the medial border of tibia. Now the second origin. Now when you will see the another origin, it comes on the fibula and it arises from mainly the head of the fibula posterior part and upper one fourth of the shaft. So this is the posterior part of the fibula and upper one, th uh, one fourth of the shaft of tibia. So this is the second area of the origin. Now the third area is a fibrous arch. Now this arch connects the tibia to the fibula which bridges over the popliteal artery and tibial nerve and it is the important area which provide continuity to the origin of your muscle. So where is the arch? So arch is present here. Now this here you will have the arch. So when you will see the origin, the origin comes from the tibia, it comes from the fibula and it comes from the arch. These are the three sides of the origin. Now if you will see this diagram, you are able to appreciate more. Now this is the area of the origin from the tibia. This is the area of the origin from the fibula and this is the arch. Now this arch area, if you will see the arch, you will find that deep to the arch there are two structures. You can see the red color artery and the yellow color nerve, that is the tibial nerve. So now this is very important to understand that what is the origin of soleus. So soleus is arises, origin starts from the fibula, then the arch and then the soleal line on the tibia with the upper part of medial border. Now the muscle has a dense aponeurotic lamina upon either surface. Now what does it mean? That when you will see this muscle, this is the inner surface of the soleus and this is the outer surface of the soleus. Now on both the surfaces of the soleus, you will find aponeurotic areas or the lamellas. So that's why it is written that either surface of the soleus covered by the aponeurosis and this muscle fibers become sandwich. But what is the direction of fibers? So the fiber slopes downward from anterior to posterior lamina. What does it mean? That the fibers are arranged in anterior to posteriorly. This is the direction of fiber. So fibers arises from the anterior lamina also and they are inserting in the posterior lamina. So here you can see the direction the fibers are going from anterior to posterior side. And ultimately, they are merging with the gastrocnemius, which is present posteriorly and it is superficially. So the posterior lamina is continued with the lower end of the tendocalcaneus, where it blends with the tendon of gastrocnemius. Clear? So what is the important concept to understand? That soleus is present between the two lamina. The direction of fiber is from anterior to posterior side and these posterior lamina ultimately merge with the gastrocnemius muscle which is present here and it is going to form the tendo achilles. Clear? Now what are the characteristics of the soleus? Now this is again very frequently asked question in your exam. So the soleus is pierced by the perforating veins. Now this is the first thing to understand and these veins are nothing but these are the tributaries of great saphenous vein which is the largest cutaneous vein. Now here in this diagram you can see that this is a cutaneous vein. Now from the cutaneous vein these are the veins which are going and piercing the soleus which you can appreciate that these are the points where you can see the veins are entering inside the soleus and these are the deep veins. 
So what will happen that these perforating veins are connecting the superficial system to the deep venous channel. Inside the soleus, there is a rich plexus of small veins. What does it mean? That in this area, now this is the vein which starts from the superficial and they are going into the deep, in between the muscle comes. So in this area, what will happen? These veins are going to form a venous network. And this venous network veins are not having any kind of valve. The contraction of the muscle squeezes the venous blood centripetally and the blood pushed towards the heart. So it is helpful in the venous return. And that's why the muscle is known as peripheral heart. So this is very commonly asked question in your exam. Why soleus is known as peripheral heart? So you have to write down in two lines that the soleus is pierced by the veins which are placed from connects superficial to deep and these veins pierces the soleus. Inside the soleus, these perforating veins form a venous plexus and once the muscle will contract, this venous plexus uh, pushes the blood. The muscle is helpful to push the blood from the venous plexus into the deep vein and it is helpful in the venous return towards the heart. So what is the problem? Now the problem comes is that if the muscle is not working for a longer time, like in case of comatose patients, like in a very long bad ridden patient, what will happen? Muscle is not contracting. So there is a stagnation of the blood occurs in these venous channels and it will lead to the formation of deep vein thrombosis and it can danger as a pulmonary embolism. So what will happen if blood remain collected in the soleus muscle for a longer time? There are very high chances of formation of deep vein thrombosis. Now this is again a question for your exam that morphologically soleus correspond to the flexor digitorum superficialis of the forum how? The question is that the soleus of lower limb correspond to flexor digitorum superficialis of upper limb. How? How to prove this equation? Now this equation is incomplete right now because there is a one more part which has been detached from the soleus is known as flexor digitorum brevis. Flexor digitorum the oblique line present on the anterior surface of radius. Here it is arising from the oblique line which is present on the posterior surface of tibia. It is arising from the head of the ulna near this upper part of the ulna and the arch between the ulna and radius. It is arising from the fibula and the arch between the fibula and tibia. Now till here, till here you can see that the muscle is going down but it is not forming any kind of the uh, tendons for the your digits. It ends at the posterior part of the calcaneum. Now from the posterior part of the calcaneum, this remaining area is represented by flexor digitorum brevis of the foot. So what is the similarity of the insertion? Now if you will see the similarity of the insertion, you will realize that the flexor digitorum Specialist fiber will also split for their insertion and that pattern is very equivalent to the flexor digitorum brevis which also split and then it will insert into the phalanges. So this pattern of the splitting is similar to the pattern of splitting here with the flexor digitorum superficialis of upper limb. Now which you can appreciate here that this is your flexor digitorum 
brevis of the sole and here you can see that this is the splitting of tendons and this is the pattern of insertion. In the same way, in the hand, you can see that this is the splitting of the tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis. So now, what is the answer is that soleus represent the muscular belly of flexor digitorum superficialis while the flexor digitorum brevis of the sole represent the remaining distal part of flexor digitorum superficialis. So both of them is equivalent to flexor digitorum superficialis. So if somebody will ask you how the flexor digitorum superficialis morphologically represent the soleus, so you have to actually involve the detached portion of the flexor digitorum brevis which justify the pattern of the insertion in upper limb as well as lower limb. Now we will come to the action of triceps suri. Now this action of gastrocnemius and soleus is mainly the plantar flexion of the foot. That means when you will have the foot, the both muscle will contract and your foot will go towards, yeah, uh, it will go towards the ground, your toes will face towards the ground. But this gastrocnemius also causes flexion of the knee joint because it is arising from the lower end of femur. Apart from that, the soleus is a strong muscle. Why strong? Because I told you it is a multipinnate muscle. Relatively slow plantar flexor, but it is a slow plantar flexor at the ankle joint. The soleus is an anti-gravity muscle because it helps to maintain the posture in the standing condition. It contracts alternately with the extensors and maintain the balance. The gastrocnemius provides rapid movements of the foot during running and jumping. So there are three questions in the slide. First, what is the action of the gastrocnemius and soleus? Answer is plantar flexor. Second question is which muscle is faster and which muscle is slower? Soleus is slower and gastrocnemius is faster in action. Third one is which is more powerful, answer is soleus is more powerful because it is multipinnate. Now why the difference is there in the action of gastrocnemius and soleus? So the soleus is powerful because I told you it is multipinnate in appearance and it is slow acting. Now why it is slow acting? Because it contains large number of red fibers and you know that there is a presence of venous channels. So the red fibers they are act slowly but their contraction is prolonged. The gastrocnemius is not a multipinnate, it is an example of strap muscle but it is having large number of white fibers and because of the presence of large number of white fibers, the action is rapid and it is required for the propulsion in fast walking, running or jumping. So this is the important question for your exam. that. Soleus is having large number of red fibers, so it is slow acting. Gastrocnemius is having large number of white fibers, so it is uh, fast acting. Apart from that, one strolls slow, walk along quietly and it is mainly by the soleus and that is why soleus is acting as a bottom gear. But one wins the long jump mainly with the gastrocnemius which act as a top gear. So this is again the another question. What is the question? That when you are doing running, initially your running is slow, but as you are walk, uh, running faster and faster and faster, you need just like a car when you are having initially the first gear and lastly you will have the top gear, your fifth or sixth gear of the car. In the same way, when you are start running, the bottom gear is the soleus and soleus is your muscle which is responsible for pleasant walking in the garden. But when you are doing the fast running or fast jumping, you need the rapid action and that rapid action or the top gear is provided by gastrocnemius. So this is the again question of your exam, which muscle act as a top gear during the jumping answer is gastrocnemius and the bottom gear is soleus muscle. Now we will move to the next muscle and that is the popliteus. You know that popliteus is a deep group of muscle. Now it is a triangular muscle, it forms the floor of the popliteal fossa, it arises 
intracapsularly. So, this is again the question that its origin is not visible. To see the origin of popliteus, you have to cup, cut the knee joint and then you are able to see the origin. And it arises again, I already explained this origin in the uh, lateral head of gastrocnemius. So, it arises from the lateral side of the lateral condyle and there is a groove is present and it insert between, uh, it insert in the posterior part of your tibia above the solial line. So, here you can see this is the solial line and above the solial line, this is the insertion of your triangular muscle that is popliteus. And on the lateral side, you can see that this is the area for the origin of popliteus. But the important thing is that once the tendon will come out, it passes deep to the lateral collateral ligament, but it lies adjacent to the lateral meniscus. So, it is very important to understand which you can see in this video clip that this is the knee joint capsule. Now, in this knee joint capsule, you cannot see the origin of your popliteus, but you can see the exit of the popliteus and you can see this is your lateral collateral ligament which is green in color and you can see the exit. Now, once you will cut this capsule of the knee joint, once you will remove the uh, this ca capsule, you are able to see the origin which is not visible before. Now, here the origin comes to in, uh, comes in picture which arises from the lateral side of lateral condyle of the femur. So, this is the one thing. Second thing is that this yellow color tendon comes between the your lateral meniscus and your lateral fibular collateral ligament. So, what will happen that this tendon of popliteus and the fibers of the muscle helpful to pull this lateral meniscus outside the joint and prevent the crushing of the lateral menisci during the uh, your sports or during your heavy running. So, this is very commonly asked question in your exam why medial meniscus having more chances of the injuries in the sports as compared to the lateral meniscus. So, you have to keep this thing in mind that lateral meniscus is having the attachment with the fibers of the popliteus. So, this popliteus pulls the lateral menisci outside the joint during the powerful uh, flexion movements of the knee joint and that is why this medial meniscus is having more chances for the injury as, as compared to the lateral meniscus. And what is the action of popliteus? Popliteus is known as unlocking of knee joint. Now, this is the question. The locking is caused by quadriceps femoris, unlocking is initiated by the popliteus and it pulls the lateral meniscus and prevent the crushing or trapping of the lateral meniscus. Now, here also in this video clip, you can see that this is the popliteus muscle on the posterior side. This is the your solial line, below that you have the soleus, above that you have the insertion of the popliteus. Popliteus tendon is deep to the lateral collateral ligament and it is having the relation with your lateral meniscus, clear? Now, what about the next muscle is flexor digitorum longus. Now, the flexor digitorum longus, it mainly arises from the posterior surface of the tibia below the solial line. So, now you have to keep in mind the three deep muscle flexor digitorum longus, tibialis posterior and flexor hallucis longus. So, flexor digitorum longus arises from the tibia. Now, here you can see that this is the solial line and below the solial line, it is the origin of the muscle is flexor digitorum longus. And you can see that this is bipinnate in the appearance. Its tendon passes along the medial side of the sustentaculum telli of calcaneum and enters the sole of the foot. Now, this is the important thing. It is related on the medial aspect of the sustentaculum telli. There are three questions related to the sustentaculum telli. One is below the sustentaculum telli. Another is medial to the sustentaculum telli and above the sustentaculum telli. So, right now we are talking about medial to the sustentaculum telli. The answer is your flexor digitorum longus tendon. Then it divides into the four parts. For the four toes, it is not having the relation with your great toe. And the four tendons are commences, receives the insertion of flexor digitorum accessorius, which you know that it is a muscle of your uh, sole. And this flexor digitorum accessorius is helpful to rectify the action of the flexor digitorum longus. It, the 
of this flexor digitorum longus also give origin to the lumbricals. What, where is the insertion? The tendon of flexor digitorum longus they are the long tendon. So, they will pierce the flexor digitorum brevis. There is a splitting of flexor digitorum brevis and the longus will pass between that split and they will reach to the distal phalanx. So, they will pass into the flexor sheath of the lateral photos, then they perforate or they pierce the tendon of flexor digitorum brevis and ultimately insert on the base of distal phalanx that you can see in the coming slides. Now, here you can appreciate that this is entering from the medial side of your uh, ankle joint, then the tendon is going forward and it is dividing into the 1, 2, 3, 4 tendons. Now, here you can see that they are approaching this distal phalanx of your lateral four toes, not for the great toe. Apart from that, here you can appreciate one more important thing that where is the sustentaculum telli? So, this is the sustentaculum telli. Now, here you can see this tendon lies on the medial aspect of sustentaculum telli. Now, here you can see this is the attachment of flexor digitorum accessorius on the lateral side of the tendon. See that these are the four lumbricals which are arising from the four tendons of your flexor digitorum longus. Now, in this diagram, in this video clip, you can appreciate that when you will see the flexor digitorum longus, you have to go on the posterior compartment of the leg. You can see that it is uh, entering into the sole through the medial aspect. Now, in the medial aspect, it is going deep into the sole from this area. Now, here you can see this is the first layer muscles. You know there, there is a flexor digitorum. This is the flexor digitorum brevis with the two abductor, abductor hallucis and abductor digiti minimi. When you will remove the first layer, now you can see the tendon of your flexor digitorum longus which is having the flexor digitorum accessorius and the lumbricals. And you can see the long tendons are here piercing the flexor digitorum brevis. And when you will see the action, you can see that it is helpful in the deflection of your phalanges. So, this is the first action and the second action is that it is also helpful in doing the plantar flexion of the foot at ankle joint. So, there are two action of the flexor digitorum longus, first on the uh, your toes and second it is also acting on the ankle joint like a plantar flexor. Now, here in this clip you can appreciate that these white tendons are the flexor digitorum brevis and the yellow tendons are flexor digitorum longus. And here you can see this is entry point of your flexor digitorum longus tendon. Once you will remove the muscles of the first layer, you can appreciate the long tendons are going straight. Here you can see the pattern of the insertion which is very important. The splitting is a feature of flexor digitorum brevis which is as resemblance as the flexor digitorum superficialis of your upper limb. Now here if you will see the long tendon of the flexor digitorum longus, you will find that the flexor digitorum longus is passing along the medial side of the ankle joint, not on the lateral side. So, this is again I am saying again and again because you have to keep this thing in mind that long tendon enters through the medial aspect of your joint. Now, when you will remove the muscles of the first layer, what you are able to appreciate that the tendon of your flexor digitorum longus is having one more additional muscle that I already told you that is flexor digitorum accessorius which is now visible here and this flexor digitorum accessorius is helpful to achieve the desired movements of your flexor digitorum longus. Now, these are the four lumbricals which are arising from the adjacent tendons of the flexor digitorum longus muscle. Clear? Now, here you can see th this is your fibrous uh, uh, flexor retinoculum and deep to that you will have the entry of your long tendons. Now, the next muscle is flexor digitorum longus muscle relation with the other long muscles. Now, see there are three long muscles flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus and tibialis posterior. Now, sometimes you have the question related to their relation. Now, here the important thing is the tendon of the muscle slopes downward across the posterior surface of the tendon of tibialis 
posterior in the lower part of leg. Now, what does it mean? That the tendon of muscle slopes downward across the posterior surface of the tendon of tibialis posterior. Now, here in this diagram, you can see this yellow color tendon is tibialis posterior. So, tibialis posterior tendon is the deepest tendon. This is the deepest tendon. When you are reading the three tendon, tibialis posterior, one is the tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus. You have to keep this thing in mind that the tibialis posterior muscle tendon is deepest. Now, posterior to the tibialis posterior, you are having the tendon of flexor digitorum longus. So, this is an image based question that identify this muscle. So, how to identify? You have to keep this thing in mind that this tendon which is approaching only the tarsal bones is tibialis posterior and just behind the tibialis posterior, what should be the next tendon? Flexor digitorum longus and what is this tendon? Now, then this tendon which is the posterior most tendon is flexor hallucis longus, clear? So, this has become very important to uh, keep in mind because there are so many questions that we will discuss in the coming slides. Now, here this is the inferior view where you can again see that this is the deepest tibialis posterior and this is just adjacent to the tibialis posterior is the flexor digitorum longus. But here the important thing comes is that the tendon of flexor hallucis which is the posterior most tendon in the sole comes between the tibialis posterior and flexor hallucis longus. Clear? So, this is the straight tendon of flexor hallucis longus which is entering into the great toe and this is the oblique tendon of flexor digitorum longus and this yellow color is the tibialis posterior. Now, what is the question? The question is that this is your talus bone. Now, here you can see this is the talus bone. Now, on the posterior side of the talus, you are having a notch. So, the question is which tendon is responsible or occupied in this notch? Answer is this is flexor hallucis longus. Why it is flexor hallucis longus? Because now we have the knowledge that the tendon which is most anteriorly and which enters and end at the tarsal bones is tibialis posterior and the tendon which is just posterior to tibialis posterior is flexor digitorum longus. So, this remaining third tendon is flexor hallucis longus. Now, this flexor hallucis longus present into this notch on the posterior side of your talus bone. Apart from that, this is your sustentaculum talli. So, you can see that this tendon is passing below the sustentaculum talli. Here you can see this yellow tendon is above the sustentaculum talli. So, I told you there are three questions. Which tendon is sustentaculum talli above, medial to the sustentaculum and below? So, below is most commonly asked question. The answer is flexor hallucis longus. Above is tibialis posterior and medially is flexor digitorum longus to the sustentaculum talli. So, the flexor hallucis longus, now if you see the origin, it arises from the fibula. Flexor digitorum longus arises from tibia and tibialis posterior arises from both tibia and fibula. Now, this grooves the posterior surface of the talus which I already told you this question and it also responsible to make a groove under surface of sustentaculum talli. Now, here you can see that this is the under surface of sustentaculum talli and if you will have this image based question, answer is flexor hallucis longus. Now, this flexor hallucis longus, if you will see the action, it is mainly causes flexion of the great toe, but apart from that, it also helpful in the plantar flexion at the ankle joint along with we have seen uh, your flexor digitorum longus. It pulls the powerful muscle in important factor and it maintain the medial longitudinal arch this is again the important thing of about this muscle that the arch or the concavity on the medial side is maintained by the flexor hallucis longus muscle. Now, here in this video clip, if you will see the flexor, though now there are the two flexor, this is the flexor digitorum from the tibia, this is flexor hallucis comes from the fibula. 
Now both of these flexors are passing along the medial side. Here you can see it is grooving on the posterior side of the talus, then it is passing below the sustentaculum telli and then it goes straight forward deep to the tendon of flexor digitorum longus. Now here if you will see the insertion, it is inserting at the distal phalanx of your great toe. Now when you will see the, uh, this is the great toe. Now when you will see the action of the flexor hallucis longus, there are two action. One, it causes the flexion of your phalanges of the great toe along with the flexion, plantar flexion of your other part of the toes. Apart from that, this is the action which you can see it is possible at the ankle joint and this is known as plantar flexion of your uh, foot. Clear? So there are two action. One is it movement of the phalanges, second is movement of the ankle joint. Now tibial is posterior, now tibial is posterior comes from both tibia as well as fibula. So this is the important thing to understand that the flexor hallucis longus comes from the fibula, flexor digitorum longus comes from the tibia and tibial is posterior comes from both tibia and fibula and interjoining interosseous membrane. So it comes from the membrane and both the bones. On the tibia, it comes from the area below the, you know, below the origin of soleus. It enclosed in a synovial sheath and that sheath is known as flexor, uh, flexor sheath which passes deep to the flexor retinoculum. The important thing is about the insertion of the tibialis posterior. Now tibialis posterior is having a multiple insertion, mainly insertion on the navicular. These all are the tarsal bone. Now anterior to the talus there is a navicular bone. So this is the navicular bone and the main insertion is on the navicular. But apart from the navicular, it is having some attachment on the sustentaculum telli. All the three cuneiform which you can see here, it is inserting on the cuneiform bones. On the cuboid bone, this is the cuboid bone and it also insert on the second, third and fourth meta tarsals. Clear? So this tendon of tibialis posterior almost give a strip or attachment to all the bones of the foot. Main action comes on, main insertion comes on the navicular bone. Apart from that, it also gives slips to the different bones of the foot like sustentaculum telli, all the three cuneiforms, your cuboid and second, third and fourth metatarsals. What is the action of tibialis posterior? Again, it is crossing the ankle joint, so it is helpful in the plantar flexion of the ankle joint. But the main action is that it is a evolter of the foot and adducts the forefoot. Now, this eversion and adduction of the forefoot is possible at the subtalar joint. Another important thing is it passes behind the medial malleolus, so it is plantar flexor of the ankle joint. It is a principal inverter of the foot. Now, this is the question of your exam that which muscle is causing mainly the inversion, answer is tibialis posterior and it also contribute in the maintenance of the medial longitudinal arch. Whenever we are talking about the inversion, inversion is a combined action of tibialis anterior as well as tibialis posterior. So in this video, the tibialis posterior, it is arising from both this red color area of the tibia and this adjacent red color area of the fibula plus there is a interosseous membrane, so posterior surface of interosseous membrane. So for the tibialis posterior, you have to look for the posterior surface of the leg, not on the anterior surface. Now up, after that, if you will see the origin of the tibialis posterior fibers, you can see that the fibers will arise and they will pass from this medial side of the uh, calcaneum and then they will enter into the foot. In the foot, I already told you that fibers will divide into the multiple strip, main insertion is on the navicular bone. The important thing is that these are the multiple points where the muscle will insert, but the main insertion is on the navicular. Now this tendon is the deepest tendon. We have seen there are three long tendon, flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus and tibialis posterior. So tibialis posterior is the main tendon and if you will see the dry tibia, you will find a groove on the posterior side of medial malleolus. So this is again question of your exam, which muscle is going to form a groove on the posterior side of the medial malleolus, answer is tibialis posterior. So this is the tibialis posterior, it is entering and it is dividing into the multiple strips which are inserting into the different bones of your foot. 
Now, when you will see the action, you can see this is the inversion. But this inversion is not solely possible by the tibialis posterior. It is also contributed by the tibialis anterior. So, here you can see this is the tibialis anterior and posteriorly you will have tibialis posterior. But the important thing is that in the inversion, the ankle joint is not moving. Your forefoot is moving at subtalar joint. Clear? So, this is the important thing to understand that when the we are doing the inversion, we are not moving the ankle joint actually. It is the only the movement which are taking place at your uh, subtalar joint. So, the forefoot is moving inside. Clear? And it is also causing the plantar flexion where you will have the movement at ankle joint. So, at the end of this class of your muscles of your four, uh, front, back of the leg, you are able to understand there are two groups, superficial group and deep group. I told you about what do you mean by the tendoacalis, what do you mean by the peripheral heart. We have seen the relation of the tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus and flexor hallucis longus. I told you about the small, small questions which tendon is responsible to make a groove in the muscles of, uh, in the bones of your uh, foot. So, this is all for today's class. Thank you.